Hey everyone, this is Christine Ballas and I'm coming to you live from the beautiful state of Florida. And you know, we are visiting this beautiful property here and uh, my eye caught this beautiful field as we pan over here. And not only is it a beautiful field, but there is like a tent or a hoopah set up here in the distance. And it reminded me that this would be a perfect backdrop as we begin this new biblical month of Elul because Elul is known as the month when the king is in the field. So I pray that you enjoy the chalkboard teaching coming up and be blessed and know that the king of all kings is in your midst. Blessing. Welcome to the chalkboard teaching for the new biblical month that we are entering into. It is the month of Elul, and Elul is the sixth month in God's spiritual calendar, and the number six is connected with the Hebrew letter Vav, which is a picture of a nail and even a tent peg. And it really connects perfectly with this month because the month of Elul is known as the month when the king is in the field. And in ancient Israel, the king would come down in one month and he would set up his tent and dwell among his people. And you know, that is a type and shadow of exactly what Jesus did. He left his heavenly palace and he came down and he set up his tent and dwelled among us, right? It says that in the book of John 1 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, our Abba so loved the world that he sent his only son into our field as a king, and whoever believes upon him will not perish, but have eternal life, all because of his great love for us. So what an awesome picture this is and reminder of God's extravagant love toward us. My name is Christine Vallis and I'm blessed to uncover the Lord's prophetic calendar in real time. So thanks so much for tuning in and I pray that you are blessed by this teaching. So all of God's creation, even his calendar, points to Jesus and his great love for us month by month and day by day. And if we look back in the month of Av, the Lord was highlighting himself as our Abba Father and encouraged us to get a fresh revelation of his great love for us and to receive him and believe his good report over our lives. And now as we move forward into this month of Elul, he is directing our hearts to his great greatest expression of his love toward us once again, and that is the gift of giving his only begotten son, Jesus, the king of all kings, into our very field. He is in our midst. And he is the only just and wise king who rules with love and righteousness. And there is no other God who came down to man. In Hebrews, it says that Jesus was crowned with glory and honor by the Father, and he destroyed the works of the devil, and he conquered death for every man. He restored that relationship that was lost in Eden, and thanks to Messiah, now we can come boldly to his throne of grace. So the king of all kings is in our field and he calls us to receive him as our king and to let him rule in the most important field of all, and that is the field of our hearts. And when we do, it's as if he puts his tent pegs permanently down and seals us as with his signet ring with his Holy Spirit, and we become his permanent dwelling place. So he's not just the king in our field in just a Elul, but he is the king of our hearts forever, 365 days a year, 24-7. That is awesome. So if you've never received Jesus as a king of your heart, I encourage you to do so because you will never 
be the same and it's the best decision that you can make and not only do we become new royal creations in Christ but as the word says we get transferred into a whole new kingdom check it out in Colossians 1 it says for he has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So just like in the physical, when we move from one country to another or from one kingdom to another, we discover that there are different ways of doing things, right? Like for example, if you were to move from the United States to the United Kingdom, you would see that everyone is driving on the other side of the road or the wrong side of the road, right? And you'll also learn that the currency is different. And if you ask for chips and salsa, you're gonna get French fries. So it's the same thing in God's spiritual kingdom. There are different ways of doing things. Like for instance, if we wanna prosper, we don't take, 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 we give. And it comes back to us pressed down and shaken together. And if we wanna become fruitful in our lives, we don't work 24 seven like the rest of the world, but rather we start from a place of rest and we work for six days and rest on the seventh. And if we desire to become the greatest, Jesus says we should become the least. So his ways of his kingdom are definitely not our ways. And these are just a few examples. But you know, as I was preparing for this lesson, there were a few foundational truths about God's kingdom that he highlighted to me that I wanna share with you as we go through the chalkboard teaching for this month. And it starts with this. It starts with the awesome truth that is found in his word that the kingdom of God is an unshakable kingdom. In Hebrews 12, 28, it says this, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So what makes God's kingdom so unshakable? Well, the book of Hebrews continues on and tells us that Jesus was not only a king, but he was also the high priest and sacrifice. And in Hebrews 12, 24, it declares this, that Jesus was the mediator of a new covenant and his sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So when Jesus set up his tent among us, he was born a king in Bethlehem. He became the high priest and the mediator between God and man. And on top of that, he was the spotless lamb who shed his blood and his blood was so powerful and from such a kingdom that it cleansed our sins past, present, and future. And that's why he said, it is finished, it is done. And so his sacrifice, death, burial, and resurrection gave us the new and better covenant and opened up that relationship and access back to God. The enemy was and is defeated and the unshakable kingdom was established. So that leads to the next foundational truth of God's kingdom is that his unshakable kingdom is not just up there in the heavens somewhere, but as Jesus declared in Luke 17, 21, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. And so our reality as believers is that his unshakable kingdom lives in us. It's not something um, outward that we're trying to get from the outside. It's something inward that was established on the cross and in our hearts when we receive him. And therefore we stand firm from a position of victory. And this is a foundational truth that the Lord wants us to establish in our hearts because the previous verses in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 26, also tells us this, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things that can't be shaken will remain. Meaning that there are things in our life that will be shaken because we live in a fallen world and it's just the essence of life itself. But no matter what is going on in our world, in our homes, in our relationships, even in our bodies and even in our minds, things may try to come and shake us, but no matter what is being shaken, the kingdom of God within us cannot be shaken. 
So as things start shaking around us, and they will, as we respond with the unshakable truths of his kingdom that is within us, we will not be shaken because our hearts are established in the surety of his word and the security of his spirit within us. And so when we get a fresh revelation that we are from an unshakable kingdom that lives within us, a holy royal authority will begin to rise up within us as we're reminded of the truths of God's word that says he will never leave us or forsake us and that he is not a man that he should lie and he's my mediator. The enemy has been defeated and that's when we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper and he is my king. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So this is awesome, and this is our true reality in the Spirit. Now when Jesus came down into our field, his work on the cross tore open that veil that once separated us from God, and now we can walk freely with him in the open fields just like Adam and Eve did in Eden. But you know, our king is also a gentleman and he will not force his way into the fields of our lives. But when we know how much God loves us, we will run to him and give him open access into all the areas and all the spheres and fields of our lives. So let's walk with him through the most precious parcels of our lives and those fields that include our marriage, our home, our family and our work, even our fields of influence and dreams and even our battlefields. And as we walk with him and we talk with him, we will discover that our king is also a master gardener and he gives the best gardening advice over all these parcels so he will help us to get our fields in order so that we can reap a plentiful harvest. And this is connected to the body part that's associated with the month of Elul. It is the left hand up here in the corner of the chalkboard. It is a call to action and to fix what is broken. So he will show us what fields need weeding and which ones need water, which ones need a complete rest. And he'll also remind us to leave gleanings for others. So as he calls us to put our hands to the plow this month, let's be reminded of John 15, that he is the vine and we are the branches. And as we abide in him, we will bear much Fruit, but apart from him, we can do nothing. So this is yet another way his kingdom works. Now, if there's anything in our fields that the Lord highlights that is not of him or his word, but somehow got rooted in there from our fleshly desires or our emotions, let's let them fall and let's allow him to shape us so that what is only of him remains. And our Lord is a tender vine dresser, and he prunes us by the faithfulness of his word and the gentleness of his love. Now the Lord wants us to yield a fruitful harvest, and it points to yet another foundational truth of his kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God is a kingdom of increase. So if you're not sure if God is a God of prosperity, well, if you've been born again, you became rich in your spirit when you received him. That's being spiritually prosperous. And as Jesus said in John 10:10 10, 10, that he came to give us life, but not just life, but life and life abundantly. That is increase. So his kingdom is one of prosperity for all the fields of our life. In our spirit, we were translated from darkness to light. And in our souls, we don't have to suffer poverty in our emotions because he's given us the fruit of his spirit. And in our minds, we don't have to believe lies. We can believe the truth of his words, which are spirit and life. And in our bodies, sickness has been defeated by his stripes. We are healed. And in our relationships, we've been given his love to love others. And lastly, in our resources, we've been given the ability to create wealth so that we can be blessed to be 
a blessing. So just as Matthew 6.33 declares, as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, all these things will be added unto us. So the kingdom of God is a kingdom of increase. Now the tribe connected to this month also points to another aspect of the kingdom of God and the tribe is Gad and he's the seventh son of Jacob and Leah's maid Zilpah and his name actually means good fortune. Now Jacob's blessing over Gad was this, a troop shall tramp upon them but he shall triumph at last. So when the children of Israel went in to possess the promised land, Gad actually chose to settle on the east side of the Jordan River along with Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh. And that put them in close physical proximity to the Ammonites and the Moabites who were their not so friendly neighbors. But this gave Gad a constant readiness for battle and their willingness to face their hostile neighbors at any time teaches us that spiritual preparedness is essential as we face our spiritual foe. So it's time that we know our place in the company of the Lord, not as tyrants, but as triumphant warriors like Gad, emboldened in our true identity and our authority in him. And this reminded me of a verse in Matthew from chapter 11, verse 12, that says, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Now, there are many ways to look at this verse, but one way that I understand it is this. Since the kingdom of God is within us, it suffers violence of the world that comes against it right? Like the lies of the enemy and fear and poverty and doubt and the list goes on and on. So the kingdom of God suffers violence, but the gospel does not preach physical violence. We know that, but it does preach spiritual violence. And we do not take up weapons of physical warfare, but we do use weapons of spiritual warfare. And we do fight battles, but they're in the spirit toward the enemy himself. So we are called to be spiritually violent in our faith, in our believing, fighting the good fight of faith. And that is the proactiveness, the spiritual readiness for battle that is necessary on our behalf in order to possess all that has been freely given to us. And we do that through our prayers, through our believing, through our words, and even through our actions. So when we realize that the kingdom of God within us is being attacked, Let's not run away and fear and back down, but let's be like Gad and be ready in season and out. And let's resist the enemy by standing for and defending the unshakable kingdom of God within us. And as we do, he will flee. So now the Lord also wants us to discover another aspect of our heavenly king, and that is he is also our heavenly bridegroom. And you know, we have all been created to be a heavenly bride. In fact, the month of Elul is actually known as the wedding month. So we were all meant to be spiritually married to Messiah. But when sin got in the way between us and God, God was so jealous for our love that he sent Jesus into our field to redeem us back to himself. And now nothing can separate us from his love again. So this month he's inviting us into his hupa, which is the Hebrew word for wedding tent, so that we can spend time face to face with him. And in fact, the word Elul actually is a Hebrew acronym for the Bible verse out of Song of Solomon that we see here on the curtains of his hupa, and that is, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And so this scripture from Song of Solomon 6.3 is actually quoting the bride and she is saying this of herself. She is saying, I am God's beloved and God is my beloved. And it reminds me of the words of the disciple John 
who called himself the disciple who Jesus loved. So both John, the disciple, and this bride knew that they were loved by God, that they were loved by Jesus. And so the Lord wants us to know that we are his beloved bride. And so it's so important to get this truth planted into the good soil of our hearts because it so often gets overrun with weeds of fear and worry and doubt. But his perfect love will cast out any fear. And that's why the truth of his love is the foundation of everything because it flows into all the other fields of our heart and lives. So again, it's not telling God how much we love him, but it's understanding and believing how much he loves us. And that gives us a boldness and a strength and a rest. And it's something that we can never stop hearing. So let's run into his hoopah and into his great love for us and perhaps even respond in saying, I do, for the first time or even renewing our vows afresh to our beloved bridegroom, Jesus. Now, as we make our way around the chalkboard, we will see that the constellation connected to this month is Virgo. And the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The gospel is actually on circuit over our heads and all of the stars point to Messiah. We are not talking about astrology. That is the counterfeit. We are talking about God's handiwork, his astronomy in the heavens. So this month, Virgo is a picture of the Virgin and highlights the young Virgin Mary and her faith. And she conceived and brought forth Messiah from her seed as prophesied in Genesis 3.15. And it was truly a sign and a wonder. So I wanna share two things that the Lord highlighted to me through the constellation. And the first thing is, is as believers, we all carry Messiah in us. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so we are all chosen and we are all highly favored and we each play a special part in history. So let's respond to our call just as Mary did, saying with joy, be it unto me according to your word, O Lord. Now the second thing that the Lord um, pointed out to me was about her seed, and that seed was the incorruptible seed of God. It talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 1, and the verse says, we have not been redeemed by corruptible things like silver or gold, but by the blood of Jesus being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed through the word of God. So the world may be corrupt around us, it may be failing and falling apart, but we have been redeemed by the incorruptible seed of God it is unshakable and it will stand forever. So in all of our sowing, let's plant the incorruptible seed of his word that will not fail us into the good soil of our heart and we will bear a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 so lastly, I always like to see where Elul is recorded in biblical history, and we find it in Exodus chapter 34. And this is where God extended mercy toward Israel after the sin of the golden calf. And as we read through that portion, we will learn that God called Moses back up to Mount Sinai for another 40 days. And it's known as the 40 days of favor. And that actually begins on the first day of the month of Elul, and it ends on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, on the 10th day of the next month of Tishri. So during those 40 days of favor, as we read in Exodus 34, we see that the Lord renewed his covenant with Israel and he gave Moses the second set of commandments. And he also responded to Moses' request to see his glory. And it was there when God put Moses into the cleft of the rock 
rock, which is such a place of intimacy, almost like a tent in a way. And then he let all of his goodness, which is his glory, pass before him. Then we see that Moses responded bowing down in humility, just like the Hebrew letter that's connected to this month. It is the Hebrew letter Yod. And that letter depicts a man bowing down to his king in humility and repentance and receives mercy from the hand of God. And so that reveals yet another theme of this month of Elul, and that is of repentance. And you know, repentance gets such a bad rep, but it really is such a gift because it gives us the opportunity to change our mind, to turn our eyes off of our flesh and onto our King and his great love for us. And that reveals the truth that Romans 2 declares that it is the kindness of our King that leads us to repentance. What a loving King we serve. So in closing, Elul is the sixth month and is the midpoint of the spiritual year, but it's also the last month of the civil year. And so as we wrap up this year, I believe the Lord is calling us to end the year strong. And so Lord, we thank you that we can end the year strong when we get a fresh revelation that your unshakable kingdom God lives within us. And Lord, would you reveal to us yet again your great love for us so that we can be rooted and established in your love and that perfect love will cast out fear. So even as the shofar sounds almost every day this month, let it be a daily awakening to our true identity in Messiah. So as his beloved bride, let us make this declaration that will not only move us through this month of Elul, but it will propel us into the new year. And let's say with confidence, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Thanks for listening, guys, and be blessed.